Well, it's September. Fall is in the air, you can tell, because I've got my fall boy turtleneck on. I can hear the happy scurrying of little feet as girls and women of all ages run past my window on their way to Starbucks for the first pumpkin spice latte of the year. All is basically right with the world for those of us that love this season, because this fall, 2024, brings an extra special event, and I am not talking about the presidential election, I am talking about the Odysseus movie. It's almost here, you guys. It's coming this month. The Odysseus movie, The Return, with Rafe Fiennes, is going to premiere at the Toronto Film Festival. We won't get our hands on it until December, which is good because we've got a little more time here on Young Heretics to talk through the Homeric stories. And that's, if you'll remember, why I embarked upon this mission in the first place. Although, if I'm being perfectly honest, I will take essentially any excuse to talk about Homer and I have basically embarked now on a whole separate thread of wanderings through the backstory of the Homeric poems, the history of their creation, their interpretation, and it has been a blast. This is OG Young Heretics. This is the first topic we ever did, and we are revisiting it now with good reason, good occasion too. But time moves ever onward, and we have reached the climax, the end of the Iliad. There is so much good stuff to read with you today, and so much moving stuff. The end of the Iliad is an end befitting a war epic. It's befitting the epic that invented the concept of war epic, at least for us. And one thing that makes it special, that sets it apart from your typical war epic, if you think about the stereotype you might have in your mind about the war epic, you think, yeah, maybe there's going to be some heart-wrenching moments with the soldier and his buddy, and maybe there'll be some tearjerker aspects to it, but ultimately the end is about the violence, and it's about the war, and it's about the fighting. And let me say, I am not knocking that at all. I think those are great movies, some of them. I've seen and loved many a war epic movie in my time. But what sets the Iliad apart as kind of the Mac Daddy of them all is that it does have all that action. It does have the gore and the violence and the fighting and the conclusion, not to the war itself, but basically the conclusion gets written, set in stone at the end of the Iliad. But it also has some of the tenderest moments in these final books. I really think the sequence that ends the Iliad begins with book 16 and goes all the way up through book 24. So I'm going to read to you from a selection of those books now as we get through to the end of what happens here. And it's the highest highs and the lowest lows come in this climax of the poem, as befits the trajectory of the story. And we've been focusing throughout, I would say, on this theme of the Iliad, that even though these mortal men have almost godlike powers, they can reason with each other in this very lucid way, they can fight at a level that almost wounds the gods, that draws the interest of the cosmic powers that rule the universe. And yet, and yet, at the pinnacle moment, at the final stage, right when it seems like they might go huper ison, it's called in the Greek, beyond their fate, transcend death, move past the boundary of human life and become something more than mortal. At that very moment, we always have the brutal, the pitiless, the heartbreaking reminder of our mortal state, that we are not destined, at least in human terms, to stretch beyond our mortality, that we all go down to the veil of death among the shades. And the poem is not afraid to openly indulge in, or I should say express, the sorrow of that, which makes it, I think, both more manly and more complex than your typical stereotype, either the negative stereotype of the feminists who say men are just chest-thumping apes, or the reactionary stereotype of the Manosphere guys who say, well, yeah, we are chest-thumping apes and we'll ch th thump our chests harder than anybody. 
True manhood, true masculinity, as I've discussed many times on this podcast, is rich, complex, and well-rounded. It includes the full suite of human virtues, not just courage, valor, strength, but also insight, sensitivity, prudence. And Achilles, I've been suggesting, even though he's a flawed person, and even though he certainly makes mistakes in the poem, he also embodies this full vision of manhood that he plays instruments and sings, he reflects, he even philosophizes, and the full scope of that humanity is on display in the drama between, it's really Achilles, his companion Patroclus, and Hector, the hero of the Trojans, although all the characters that we've met along the way will get involved. But the inciting incident that sets this chain of events in action is Patroclus, and we haven't talked that much about Patroclus yet. He is, as I said, the companion of Achilles. He's always there with him by his side, his dear friend. He's actually older than Achilles, even though it's easy to imagine him as younger because Achilles is sort of the head of the relationship. That is, he leads and he's the strong one and Patroclus is the sidekick, no question. But there's also, and we have to talk about this, there's a long-standing idea that these two were also lovers, that they were in some sort of romantic relationship. And that is an ancient idea. The concept of a romantic relationship between an older soldier and a younger soldier, between two comrades in arms, was definitely not foreign to the classical Greek mindset and even was a historical element of some fighting units in the ancient world. And many ancient readers, as well as many, many modern readers, have been tempted to read that back into this poem, that there's some subliminal romance or subcurrent of attraction that is physical and sexual involved in this relationship. So that's an ancient idea. It was expressive at the time of a, of a certain culture that had come up, come to exist in Athens that was being read back into the poem. And now that we have this culture that's very, very fascinated on non, I say abnormal just as a purely descriptive sense, not in a pejorative sense, but different kinds of sexuality than the normal heterosexual one, we too are very, very tempted to take our modern concerns and read those back into this poem. You're always getting my take when you listen to this podcast, so you'll hear other people make different arguments based on the text, and that's fine. But from my perspective, there is actually no textual support in the poem for the idea that Patroclus and Achilles are romantically involved. And I'm saying that purely as a descriptive matter. I just don't think Homer suggests even that that's going on. I think later readers who had their own concerns, including later Greek readers in the classical period and afterward, were tempted to see that as a kind of innuendo because they were so familiar with that and recognized it. And we, who are so preoccupied with these matters, also are tempted, not just in the Iliad, but in, say, Lord of the Rings, where it definitely isn't, or a bunch of other stories of masculine friendship to read this subcutaneous romance in there. And I want to say something about this before we get into the scenes with Patroclus and Achilles, because it is important to clear away our own modernity glasses so that we can see the poem as clearly as possible. And this thing that we do totally irrespective of what you think about homosexuality. You can be a fire and brimstone, rain down judgment upon the gays type of person. You can be a rainbow touting, freewheeling, pride parade marching homosexualist, and you can have any range of opinions about this. And still, understand me when I say that, this temptation we have, this tendency or reflex to read scenes of male intimacy as sexual and to not just approve homosexuality in romantic contexts, but to extend it out and to find it wherever we see two men being close with one another, sharing their emotions, sharing their feelings, is incredibly disrespectful, both to whatever romance there is in homosexual relationships and, importantly, to male friendship. We're always saying about men that they need to be more open with their feelings, that they need to be more expressive. But straight men don't want to be understood to be gay, to be mistaken to be gay, which is totally 
understandable and reasonable and not a crazy or evil thing. They want their relationships to be of the character they intend and not to be misconstrued and fraught with sexual tension where there is none. And so, of course, of course, men, if you treat them this way, if you're always insinuating that they might have a feeling or a kind of the hots for their buddy, are going to go out of their way to do no homo, to try to pretend that they don't have these close emotional connections. And even more broadly, outside of the gender stuff and the male-female stuff, it's a terrible disservice to friendship which is actually in the Aristotelian framework a moral virtue and certainly a deep emotional human need to have non-sexual but emotionally deep and close and confiding relationships. It's a horrible disservice to people to suggest that they can't have that relationship without sexual tension lurking. Because then how do you have an outlet for all the things that you want to say and all the things you want to share that maybe wouldn't be appropriate with your spouse or in your sexual relationship, all of that is shut off and closed. And we have this terrible epidemic of friendship. We have this lack of friendship in the world, especially among men, that is in many cases driving men to terrible extremes. So we absolutely have to do away with this thing. Oh, Sam and Frodo were totally lovers. Or like uh, even in this poem, this is why I'm spending some time at the outset here saying this, because it's the root of a lot of other dysfunction in our relationships. And again, this is a, a, an a point that you can take, something that you can see and understand, whatever your opinion is about homosexuality separately as a phenomenon, that to, whether you accept it or not, to retroject it into close male friendships is really destructive for people and prevents us from understanding the actual relationship in this poem, which is a beautiful and tender one, as demonstrated by, I think, the first passage I want to read to you today, which is right at the beginning of Book 16. So I'm going to outline for you how this story goes, and then I'm going to read to you some special passages. So Patroclus, who is Achilles' comrade-in-arms, his right-hand man, and therefore has stood by him as Achilles has withdrawn from the battle to preserve his kleos, his dignity, his pride, Patroclus is deeply moved by the sufferings of the Greeks, whom... Achilles has left to die, and he's moved in many of the same ways that we are moved. And sometimes when people do accuse Achilles of being heartless or of being selfish and prideful in his removal from the army, I think Patroclus feels a lot of that too. And so he asks, if you won't go into fight, at least let me go into fight wearing your armor so that I can boost morale and buck up the Greeks. Achilles allows him to do this begrudgingly, and when he goes, it works. People mistake him for Achilles, there's terror in the hearts of the Trojans, the tide turns for the Greeks. But that final moment of Huper Ison, that final moment of going beyond what should be the destiny, the story that the characters are living in, always brings doom. And so the hand of the gods comes slamming down in the form of Apollo, strikes Patroclus down, and leaves him vulnerable to Trojan attack. He's killed by ultimately by Hector, although there's sort of a complicated chain of events that we'll get into that leads to that happening. Patroclus dies, and Achilles goes berserk. He's driven wild with sorrow and fury, and this is what ultimately will spur him back into battle at a level that frightens even his comrades, who have been trying, people like Odysseus and Agamemnon have been trying to get this guy back, anything we can do to get this guy back. Now it's like, careful what you wish for, because he has lost all humanity. And the poem is very explicit about this, that Achilles' grief, which is one of the things that Plato afterward was very alarmed by, is beyond all proportion, even for this terrible sorrow. That's how much he loved his comrade, and that's how much this has has stricken him to the heart. So he goes back into battle, and it is through that return that we get famous scenes like the Shield of Achilles, where Thetis goes and gets new armor for him from Hephaestus, and this huge, ornate depiction of life in war and in peace that gets carved onto the shield, and it's all leading us up to the moment when Achilles finally meets Hector on the battlefield, because he can't take his will out on Apollo, who's a god and can't die, but he can kill Hector, which he then does. Hector is himself cowed. The great warrior is cowed by how 
overpowered Achilles is. It's like when you go into a boss battle with all the power-ups and way more than you need. Achilles is just unbeatable. He destroys Hector, but that's not enough. That doesn't slake his thirst for vengeance, and so he continues to defile the body in a way that offends the gods. And we're clearly getting this idea that even though there's some degree of scale balancing in the loss of Hector for the loss of Patroclus, this has now gone far, far beyond the the remit of human passion, and it needs to be brought curtailed into check. And this is why I say that ultimately the poem is not afraid to be emotionally rich as well, and and even show its strongest characters in in places of deep vulnerability, because the resolution of this is that Priam, the king, the old man, is brought, shepherded by Hermes, the god, with his protection into the Greek camps to plead with Achilles for the burial, for the body of Hector to be buried. It's been preserved by the gods, and the final scene, the final climactic scene is is not the battle between Achilles and Hector, really, but it's the supplication of this old man who finally weeps with his enemy in this weird and sorrowful, awful moment of shared humanity where they weep for those they've lost. Hector is brought back and buried, and that's the end of the poem. So they buried Hector, breaker of horses, is the last line. It's really a daring act of artistic genius when you consider that these stories were known in the zeitgeist. They were around and about in the common cultural store. To to put this particular spin on them is an artistic choice on Homer's part, and it leaves you with so much more than just the satisfaction of battle victory. It does give you those scenes, but it also rounds out this picture of humanity in a world of gods that care but are more but care about more than us and have their own interests and a universe that seems seems to have a place for us but that keeps beating us back down and into death it's just i mean it is really in some sense the pinnacle of the tragic vision that then gets spun out for generations throughout the greek civilization that would would later evolve so let's begin here with the moment where patroclus pleads with Achilles to go into battle. And you'll see probably what I mean about the tenderness right off the bat. I'm translating here myself, as always, and if you are interested in translation, you should listen to our Friday episodes where I talk about how translation works. But I like to translate poems, passages afresh when we're doing this series because it helps me to really study the passages carefully, and hopefully it'll help you also to hear a fresh, maybe modern-sounding voice to the poem. So they were fighting around the ships with their sturdy seats when Patroclus stood near to Achilles, the shepherd of his troops, his tears pouring warm to the ground like a jet-black fountain stream whose water pours from the crags where not even goats will climb. Seeing him, godlike, fleet-footed Achilles was moved with pity and spoke to address him, giving voice to words on wings. Why are you crying, Patroclus, just like a maiden girl, a toddler who wants to be scooped up and held in her mother's arms, clutching her mother's skirts and tugging her back from her chores, staring up at her, crying until she gets picked up? You're just like that, Patroclus, shedding your delicate tears. This is an example of something we haven't really dealt with that much yet, and that is the Homeric simile, one of the stylistic features that Homer is known for is these extended similes. And just to review, if it's been a while since you were in middle school English, a simile is a comparison using like or as, whereas a metaphor is a comparison that doesn't use like. So in the Homeric similes, we get this Greek word hos or something similar that means like. And he'll be he'll be telling you about the battle and going on about the fighting. And then he'll say it was just like. And then he will wander off into these flights of fancy, Homer will. And it's noted that sometimes the connection is very opaque between what he's saying, what he's describing, and how he's making it vivid with this simile. In this case, I think there's a lot of... It makes a lot of sense why these similes are being used, but there's still a, a huge richness and complexity to what's going on. You'll notice that first the narrator gives us a simile, a, a relatively short one, which is that when Patroclus cries, it's like the tears are like a fountain stream from the high up uh, crags. 
And that word that I translated is where not even goats will climb. That's this wonderful Greek word, aigilips, which literally means abandoned by the goats. So not even the mountain goats can climb up to this high crag. And we've got this huge density of imagery just to tell us about the pouring tears that are like a fountain or a waterfall that pours down from those high crags. And that gives you a flavor for how these tend to work. They stand almost as these little gem-like bottle episodes in these in the construction they have their own imagery and logic within them but then when they return you to the poem there's this richer more vivid sense of what's going on so that's the narrator gives you that simile and then achilles who remember is the character that maybe most resembles the narrator in the fullness and complexity of the way he understands things achilles gives us a simile and it's not the first or only time that a hero in the poem is compared to a woman, and specifically to a woman in a position of vulnerability. This is a napia, napia, a, a tender infant girl. We've we've also had things like people being dra women being dragged off to become victims of rape in war. These are frequently similes will take these big heroes and will compare them and their situation to that of somebody like Andromache, Hector's wife, whom we talked about last week. Because there is a, not an identity, but a parallelism between these two situations, being the man who has to fight in war and being the woman left behind to suffer the consequences of war. And there's something to that here too, although it's not quite that devastating. It's not that awful, the situation, this little girl who's crying to be picked up by her mother. And you see both your classic, like, bro kind of making fun of bro, right? Like, what, he likes some crying like a little girl. And this is something that guys do back and forth to each other. But there's also this top note of affection to it, too. And, and as we know, Achilles is eventually going to grant this request. And you, you may have noticed that he says the word Patroclus, or the passage contains the word Patroclus three times. First, Patroclus stood near to Achilles, and then Achilles says, why are you crying Patroclus? And he says, you're just like that Patroclus. And we're building up enormous pathos, which is this Greek word, this pathetic, that is, emotional connection to this tragic figure, Patroclus, who just wants to save his fellows in battle but who isn't destined to win, even if he's destined to show great power. And so this is when, as he goes out, he is, in, in the end, Huper Ison. He, he brings the Greeks to a position where they are almost going beyond what is fated for them. They, they have this enormous surge rally around Patroclus until finally he's struck down by Apollo. And it, it, there's a moment here which is, I think... Well, it's certainly unique in the poem. I think it's unique in all of literature for the shocking nature of its, the way it emotionally reaches out to grab you. And that is right when Patroclus is about to go to his death, unbeknownst to him, but known to us. Right at that moment, the poet, the narrator, addresses him in the second person. He, says, he talks to Patroclus. And this is something the narrator never does. The Iliad narrator, the narrator of the Iliad is famous for his sort of detached vision of things. He's omniscient, it seems, sees everything, doesn't enter in or take sides in the dispute, except every now and then. And this is one of those times. And it's because of how awful it is. This is probably the poem's moment of deepest tragedy that Patroclus, blameless and in fact virtuous, admirable, strong, brave, and also loving and tender, is going to be struck down by the uncaring or at least dispassionate, the, the unmovable gods, Apollo being the god of, of reason and music and these sort of pristine, the pristine clarity of beauty beyond human suffering and beyond human intervention. And here he comes to bring down, to serve as the hand of fate. And usually in the poem, when something happens three times, you know that on the fourth, something different is going to happen. And that's the structure that we get here. Three times, Patroclus advances. But then on the fourth, as he charged, like the equal of something divine, then and right there, Patroclus, the end of your life was revealed. Entharatoi patrocle fane biotoio telaute. Patrocle is the vocative case, which means that it's direct address. And we know that in Greek in a way that we don't necessarily always know in English. You can see in the shape of the word that he's talking to Patroclus. Then and right there, Patroclus, the end of your life was revealed. 
Phoebus advanced on him, densely shrouded in thick mist. And you notice it goes right back into the third person. We don't ever get that address again. It's just this little moment where the narrator glances at Patroclus and by glancing at Patroclus, glances at us and breaks that, that wall. Phoebus advanced on him, densely shrouded in thick mist, a thing of dread. He slipped through the melee, unseen by Patroclus, draped under layers of air, and right beside him now, standing beside him, he struck him, finding the spot on the back, mid-shoulder, with the heel of his palm. Patroclus' eyes rolled back, and Phoebus Apollo drove the dog's leather cap from his head. It rolled in the ground with a clatter beneath the horse's feet. The fluted headgear fell, the hairs of its crest getting matted with blood and dirt. Never before had the heavens permitted this horsehair-crested helmet to fall and be stained with dirt. It had always graced the head and the brow of a godlike man, protecting Achilles. But Zeus in that moment gave it to Hector to wear on his head, since death was hovering near him too. Phew, this stuff gets so electric, and it there's endless kind of variety in here. I, I find it amazing the almost cinematic detail with which the poet turns to focus on this helmet and the significance of that, that it had its own kind of power and glory, but not, nothing to resist the god, and... Achilles, the godlike man who once wore it, isn't there to protect uh, Patroclus as he falls in battle to Hector, who is himself subject to the same decree of death that all these other heroes are. And this is what Patroclus will say to Hector as he's dying. So the next thing that happens, uh, Apollo strikes him down, Euphorbus hits him from afar with a projectile spear. That's another Trojan soldier hits him. And then Hector finishes him off. And that's the occasion for Patroclus, brave even in death, to taunt Hector and say, enjoy your triumph while it lasts because Achilles is coming for you now. So here's what Patroclus says. He says, deadly fate and the son of Leto killed me. The son of Leto is Apollo. Deadly fate and the son of Leto killed me. Next among men, Euphorbus, and you, that is Hector, you came third of all to strip the remains. But I tell you, and let it sink into your heart, you yourself won't be long alive. At this very moment, just beside you, stands death and the mighty hand of fate in the powerful son of Aeacus, blameless Achilles. And that's when the end is effectively set in stone, because now... Achilles will come into battle. Once he does, he's doomed to die young, but also to conquer Troy and to set the end of the war spinning. I would like to read to you now a little passage that retells this Patroclus story from a modern angle. There are a number of interesting retellings, actually a number, there's a bunch of interesting retellings of the Iliad. You might have heard of Alice Oswald's poem Memorial. There are movies, I've talked about the movie Troy and so on and so forth, but one that gets a little bit slept on that maybe you haven't heard of, kind of underrated retelling of the Iliad, is this poem called War Music by Christopher Logue, who's a British poet uh, from he, he sort of wrote it throughout the 1960s this this poem and it's a hyper modern sparse retelling of the story of the Iliad obviously can't replace the Iliad can't compare but unlike Troy which I think has its real defects war music is a beautiful complement to this poem and it captures I think some of the complexity the intricacy of of the moral situation in which the heroes find themselves. And this is one of its most, you could call it gimmicky. It's definitely 1960s poetry in that it plays around a lot with font size and different ways of printing stuff and so on and so forth. But it, one of the most striking things he does, and if you're watching on YouTube, I'll hold this up to the camera, is when Apollo enters onto the scene, he prints Apollo's name just all on one page, just giant Apollo entering into the fight. And I want to read to you the passage that leads up to that because it, it retells exactly the story that I just told, but in maybe a more modern and, and easy to follow sort of way. And it's very, very beautiful and effective. Remember, before we go in here, something that I said back in the first episode that Apollo is Smintheus, called Smintheus in the poem, which might mean that he's somehow the patron god of mice or something. And, and Logue plays with that here, so that you need to know that. Three times Patroclus reached Troy's wall. 
Three times he leapt toward its parapet. Three times and every time he tried it on, the smiling mouse god flicked him back. But when he came a fourth last time, the smile was gone. Instead, from parapet to plain to beachhead, on across the rocked, sunstruck Aegean, the mouse god's voice, loud as ten thousand, crying together, cried, Greek, get back where you belong. And this is in larger font now. So loud, even the yellow judges giving law halfway across the world's circumference paused. Get back where you belong. Troy will fall in God's good time, but not to you. Patroclus fought like dreaming, his head thrown back, his mouth wide as a shrieking mask, sucked at the air to nourish his infuriated mind and seemed to draw the Trojans onto him to lock them round his waist, red water washed against his chest to lay their tired necks against his sword like birds. Is it a god? Divine? Needing no tenderness? Yet instantly they touch, he butts them, cuts them back. Kill them, my sweet Patroclus. Kill them as many as you can, for coming behind you through the dust you felt, what was it? Felt creation part, and then Apollo, and there's the giant text, and then in much smaller letters, who had been patient with you, struck. His hand came from the east, and in his wrist lay all eternity, and every atom of his mythic weight was poised between his fist and bent left leg. So you can see here, I think, that this is a great example of how you can add imaginatively to a canonical text in a way that is faithful and beautiful, but still takes liberties. And this puts me in mind, by contrast, of the... Amazon TV show that everybody's talking about right now, which is the Lord of the Rings spinoff, Rings of Power. The second season of this show just came out on Amazon Prime. The first season debuted to very mixed reviews, which is putting it generously. This is ostensibly a show based on small passages in book two of Lord of the Rings, and then largely on the Silmarillion, which is J.R.R. Tolkien's kind of mythic, he would have called it a legendarium, that is where he outlines the whole scope of the universe and kind of invents the modern idea of the extended universe or the cinematic universe, although he wouldn't have referred to it that way. And the show is dealing with material that is inevitably sketchy. So there was no version of making this show that didn't involve building out new imaginative additions onto what Tolkien had written, because he never finished this, he never put it together into a final form. It was his son that really presented it in, in his published version by stitching together various different drafts and things like that. And so the problem, people are very, very mad at this Tolkien show, and I am at this point just kind of amused because I've given up on Tolkien adaptations, and I just think that our cultural climate is too degraded to really produce wonderful, mainstream, high-end things on streaming that will really do justice to the source material. But it really is a kind of an abomination. It's very boring, despite being extremely expensive and beautiful. And one thing I think about as I watch it is how amazing it is that it can be this beautiful, this well-produced, and this dull. There are these long, long stretches of people just explaining things or just walking through places and so on. But really the problem is that you have creators who have to add on to the work of a master. And they are, first of all, ideologically kind of hostile to that master's moral outlook, that there is good and evil, but also they're just not up to the task. They just don't have what it takes, the it factor that would allow them to wrestle with somebody of this caliber. And I think something similar happened at the end of Game of Thrones when they ran out of George R. R. Martin's material. It was like, you can't speak for George R. R. Martin unless you are also at the top of your game. And I think this helps us to understand the difference between reinterpretation or disservice or even disrespect, like what the Rings of Power series does that makes all the fans so mad, and inspiration or imaginative creative addition. Because there's all sorts of stuff that Logue puts in here, like Apollo has way more lines, he says stuff here, there's more address, direct address to Patroclus in just that one instance. But it's all demonstrably in the spirit of 
the poem. You can imagine the Apollo of the poem speaking this way, and it's more that he's taken the raw underlying material and reworked it in a modern look with a modern feel. Because language, the outward forms of language, does change, and the physical outward ways that we express ourselves do change. But if we believe that there's communication and continuity through time, we also believe that the underlying raw experience is at least partially shared across the generations. And that's what allows somebody like Logue to get down under the surface of the text into the spirit of the thing and then clothe it with new language. I'm just going to finish off this passage because it's so beautiful. Well, beautiful is probably the wrong word, but it's so expertly done. He's addressing Patroclus still here. Your eyes lurched out. Achilles' bonnet rang far and away beneath the cannon bones of Trojan horses. That's a nice detail, Achilles' bonnet. There are multiple different words in the Greek for helmet, but the first one is sort of like a leather cap. And so the Achilles' bonnet rang far and away beneath the cannon bones of Trojan horses, and you were footless, staggering, amazed, whirled to the outskirts of the battlefield between its clumps of dying, dying yourself, dazed by the brilliance in your eyes. The noise like weirs heard far away, dabbling your astounded fingers in the vomit on your chest. And he goes on to do this whole encounter between Patroclus and Hector, which I just read, where Patroclus says, you were the third to kill me. And here's, here's what he says. Patroclus says to Hector, big mouth, remember it took three of you to kill me, a god, a boy, and last and least, a prince. I can hear death pronounce my name, and yet... Somehow it sounds like Hector, and as I close my eyes, I see Achilles' face with death's voice coming out of it. Saying these things, Patroclus died, and as his soul went through the sand, Hector withdrew his spear and said, Perhaps. <laughs> you notice this thing where he says, I can hear death pronounce my name, and yet somehow it sounds like Hector, and as I close my eyes, I see Achilles' face with death's voice coming out of it. Really subtle and meticulous reworking of some of the nuances in the poetry, because in the original, it, remember, fate is there to kill uh, Hector, uh, Patroclus says, just beside you stands death and, and fate, and it's in the hand of Achilles. Dament Achilleos amumenos Achaido. You will be overthrown by the hands of, of Achilles, son of Aeacus, but it's fate that will be doing the overthrowing. So to put the mouth, the words of death in Achilles' mouth is sort of Logue's way of, of reworking that same idea. This is really worth, it's short, it's really worth checking out alongside the original Iliad if, if you want to. Um, I'll post the link to it in, in the description of this episode, and I'll also post a, a link to an essay I wrote about the Rings of Power thing, because I have a little more to say about Rings of Power, but we must not dwell on that. Instead, we must talk about what happens to Achilles. I've said already that the response Achilles has to this is, is deeply human, but also, in some sense, beyond the scope of human morality, human civilization. He becomes sort of like a beast and a god at once, which is the idea that Aristotle had about somebody that is removed from all civilization. He says, if anybody can live outside of political life, that is, outside of community— he must be either a beast or a god, either something more than human or something less than human. And the Achilles drama reveals that, in fact, a man who has totally cut himself off from his fellow man out of grief, out of fury, out of everything, is basically both a beast and a god at once. And that's what Achilles becomes. He won't eat. He won't sleep. He's inconsolable. Nobody can talk to him. All he wants is blood. And at this point, I want to point you to another book that you might find interesting. I say this with some reservations because the author of this book is like kind of a big lib and he gives kind of some of the big lib readings of the poem, like, oh, how mean it is to women and stuff that I really don't agree with at all. But it's worth it. And I will often say it's worth reading books that you disagree with ideologically, as I, in many cases, disagree with this guy ideologically, because he has something to contribute that nobody else really can or had up to that point. And this is the book I have in mind is called Achilles in Vietnam. And it's a, by this guy, Jonathan Shea, who worked as a therapist with victims of PTSD after Vietnam. And the whole thesis is that the Achilles of the poem shows recognizable signs of what modern clinicians would call PTSD. Now, I think there are limitations to this view. I think that 
if we only understand this as a psychological phenomenon, then we miss the cosmological and the metaphysical claims that the poem is making about man's condition, man's place in the world. But Shea gives us descriptions of what people are like after terrible suffering in war and seeing terrible things happen in war. And that part of it is really striking, how recognizable that portrait is of, of soldiers who do, still, to this day, go and fight for causes that we send them toward, some good, some mistaken, some terribly misled, but all of them doing what still must be done for the world to hang together, that is, for nations to be able to defend their borders and their people. And whether or not you agree with any individual war, war as a human constant, as a reality, is still something we ask people to undertake. And we foist onto them the whole cosmic weight of everything that the poem is about, this whole moral burden. And people who have been through that know that unless you have real support in your corner, unless you have guys and friends and comrades, but also trusted people to talk through this whole thing with spiritual guidance, this stuff can drive you insane. It can confront you with the worst of what the human predicament has to offer. And so I just want to read one little portion here about abuse of the enemy. Because remember, what happens next is Achilles goes forth, he meets with Hector, Hector flees from him on the battlefield, and Achilles, who is known as swift of foot, catches up to him and kills him, and then desecrates his corpse. And here's what Shea writes about this. Unlike the Greeks, we believe that the dead are beyond harm, so we often overlook the toxic residue left behind by disrespectful treatment of enemy dead. One of our men has intrusive memories every Christmas. And here, I, I have listeners of every age, and I'm really grateful that I have multiple different, you know, people in different every walk of life. And so out of respect for that, I'm, I'm going to edit out some swear words here, but just know that there's profanity in the book if you go read it. Uh, one of our men has intrusive memories every Christmas that center on, quote, this dead gook we hung on a tree with a big banner that said, Merry effing Christmas. Another has intrusive memories of Viet Cong dead. He was digging out of a collapsed tunnel. Apparently, as much from curiosity as malice, he cut open the chest of one corpse with his knife to see what his lungs looked like. Another veteran has flashbacks of an episode which began with his berserking. I pulled him out into the patty and carved him up with my knife. When I was done with him, he looked like a rag doll that a dog had been playing with. Even then, I wasn't satisfied. I was fighting with the corpsman trying to take care of me. I was trying to get at him for more. And this is almost exactly what happens to Achilles. There's no amount of slaughter, no amount of physical death that can satisfy his loss because his loss is not a physical loss. And that's right there, the heart of the inconsolable nature of the poem, that when you die, your spirit flees and there's nothing that can bring you back and nothing material can alter that spiritual fact. So here's what Shea says. He, this, his client is haunted not by killing the enemy soldier whose bullet could easily have blown out, blown out his brains, but by his abuse of the dead soldier's corpse. Homer's critique of Achilles' loss of respect for the enemy pervades the Iliad. Much of what Homer depicts of Diomedes, Aeneas, Glaucus, Hector, and Ajax serves mainly to draw attention to Achilles' loss of humanity and moral disintegration. I think uh, if Shea is wrong about other things, I think he's absolutely right about that. I think this poem concludes with the breakdown of Achilles, and that's the final unresolvable problem that it presents to us, which is perfect. Why? Why is that perfect? What's the first word of the poem? Rage. Menin aede thea. It's the story of Achilles' rage. It's a story of his rage at the situation that he's in, at the injustice of the universe, at everything that the poem depicts so masterfully over its 24 books. And this rage has now glutted itself, gone beyond its limits, beyond its humanity, and cries out now for some sort of resolution. And what resolution can there be in a world where there is no resurrection, where there is no discernible life after death. That's the problem that the poem confronts at the very, very end. And the answer is grief. The answer is tragedy and sorrow and grief. And that's the scene with Priam. It's such a morally mature scene, and I'm going to read to you now from it in Robert Fagel's translation, just a little chunk of it, because 
when we get to these truly climactic passages, I want to give you a professional that has done this and published it. So this is what happens when Priam clutches Achilles' knees and begs in tears. This old man, this king, who should be afforded the highest respect, now has to abase himself before this young warrior. He says, I bring a priceless ransom. Revere the gods, Achilles. Pity me in my own right. Remember your own father. I deserve more pity. I have endured what no one on earth has ever done before. I put to my lips the hands of the man who killed my son. Those words stirred within Achilles a deep desire to grieve for his own father. Taking the old man's hand, he gently moved him back, and overpowered by memory, both men gave way to grief. Priam wept freely for man-killing Hector, throbbing, crouching before Achilles' feet as Achilles wept himself, now for his father, now for Patroclus once again, and their sobbing rose and fell throughout the house. There's so much, so much contained in those few lines. The emotional truth here is something that I think I've discovered in very small measure and that perhaps sufferers of PTSD have discovered in much larger measure, which is that rage, which is a very powerful emotion and in some cases a justified response to injustice, makes you feel powerful and constantly deprives you of more and more power. The more you inhale it, the more the fumes of rage intoxicate you, the more you find that following rage leads you to somewhere that doesn't fix your problem and often makes your problem worse and worse and worse. And if you sit with rage for a while and anger, and if you contemplate it, you will find, in my experience, that underneath rage, there is almost always something else. And often that something else is sadness. Often it's sorrow at something that didn't go your way, at somebody that you trusted who whom you lost, at somebody that fought with you, that died. There is so much suffering and sorrow in the world that rage is very often the thing that the devil offers you to try and pretend that he's going to make your suffering go away. And the thing about rage is that not that it's never justified, not that you don't sometimes have to take action and do something strong, take strong action. It's just that the feeling rage gives you that you are dealing with your sorrow is an illusion. And it, the, that's why the further down that path you go, the worse things get, because actually underneath, if you scrape beneath the surface, you will very, very often find grief. And it's such a morally brilliant insight that the, the huge grief of this situation, all the deaths that Homer names, and all the mingled grief of Trojan and Greek at the situation they're in, doesn't mean the war doesn't go forward, doesn't mean that the situation is any, in any way resolved. That's what tragedy is. Tragedy is there as tragedy, and yet the proper, the fitting conclusion to a tragedy is mourning and grief. And that is how the poem ends, with three mourning songs by three women, by Hecuba, mother of Hector, by Andromache, his wife, and by Helen, who says that Hector was always kindest to her of all those that have bandied her about as she was taken to Troy. Thus endeth the Iliad. And I think in that is contained Aristotle's theory of catharsis, this idea that you go to a tragedy in order to find outlet for these things or to be purified. So what catharsis means is a kind of ritual that you go through that purifies your emotions, especially rage at the condition, the human condition, and, and gets them down to their purest element, which is often sorrow and tragedy and grief. And what comes after that? Only the next story can tell, for this one is now concluded. One of the truly great works of art in Western literature, certainly a foundational work of art in Western literature, and now you've read it with me, or parts of it with me. We are going to move on next week to the Odyssey as the, we pick up the story and continue. There's a lot of lighter stuff in the Odyssey, although there is still violence and gore and tragedy and all that stuff. It's often said, although I'm not sure quite how truly, that the Iliad is the source of all tragedy and the Odyssey is the source of all comedy. Certainly, it's more of a mythic adventure and a romp, and that's what we're going to get into next week. But for now, let's take a mailbag question. So mailbag questions come to me on Substack at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. 
You can also find me at thenewjerusalem.substack.com, but it's harder to get a hold of me that way. So I would recommend subscribing to both. There's an awesome new essay by my dad up at The New Jerusalem. I got that piece by, about Lord of the Rings up at Rejoice Evermore. I'll link to all of this in the show notes. But if you become a subscriber to Rejoice Evermore, you can really easily send me an email or a DM. I have a bunch of them, a backlog, but I am reading them. I'm taking a look at them, and I love all of your questions. So please keep them coming. This one comes from a fella named Josh. Spencer, you have periodically called your podcast the classical education you didn't know you were missing. That's true. In fact, I would say this series is a good example of how that works. For many people, this is true in exactly the way you intended it. That is, people who have gone through school but didn't get to read the Iliad or didn't get a real grounding in the liberal arts. But for me, says Josh, it has been come, become true in a different way. I recently graduated from a classical Christian school, which I attended from kindergarten through high school. So I have had a classical education. But now, as a freshman in college at an engineering school, I find myself wishing I could continue in classical education, or at least in the liberal arts. What are some things I could do to continue with the liberal arts now that I don't have a structured way to practice and engage with them? from Josh. Well, Josh, congrats on your graduation. It sounds like you had an awesome education and you should, if, it, if I don't know what your home situation is, if it was your parents or somebody else that put you into this classical Christian school, whoever they were, thank them today. Don't wait. They have done you an enormous service that will bear fruit for your whole life. And I think among the people who need a classical education, which is everybody in my opinion, People that are going into engineering or into fields that will take them away from literature are the ones I think that can perhaps most richly benefit. When I was in college, there was a program that would teach pre-med students in the liberal arts tradition so that they would have the liberal arts before they went into the kind of hellish nightmare of grinding through all their years as, I guess, an intern, or I'm not sure what it's called, but when you go to a, become a, a residency, when they went through their residency, they would have this background that would fill out their vision of the world. And that's what this will do for you, Josh. And you'll always have that, and I think that's awesome. But you're absolutely right that you got to use it or lose it. And this is not something, and I'm, this is actually something I'm stressing a lot, which is why I'm glad you wrote into me. I always stress that I can give you a list of 5, 10, 15 books, if you want, of things you should read to be well-read. And I've written those in various places. I'll link to some in the show notes. But... When people ask for that list, I think they imagine that the life of the mind or the liberal arts or the classics is something you can just like do and then be done and tuck it away in a corner in the way that you can get a degree and tuck it away in a corner or you can buy a nice car and then you have the car. Nothing is ever really like that. You always have to be sustaining and upkeeping things or they die away. There's growth and death and those are the only two options. There is no true stasis, but some things are more static than others. And a classical education, the life of the mind, is not a static thing. And that's why you can't just call it done and dusted after you've read the Chicago series of greatest books or whatever. Instead, what you must now do is you must learn to cultivate the life of the mind. And it's called the life of the mind because it is a way of life that you have to practice now. And the good thing is that it's the best way of life and it's going to make you joyous and it will bring joy into your life and richness and expand your soul in a way that nothing else can. That's the point of literature is to open new rooms in your soul. And you have to do it the same way you would adopt any other kind of life practice, like a prayer life, like an exercise routine. You have to create a structure for it. And the structure means that you're going to have to trade things that you would otherwise do. It's like working out. If I want to go to the gym today, I have to not do an hour-ish of other stuff, right? I'm doing that because I'm getting way more out of it than I would get out of an hour of sitting on the couch and watching Netflix, especially if it's Netflix the way Netflix is these days, right? So life is just a series of those trade-offs and building a good life is just making the trade-offs that are gonna pay off for you, just like an exercise routine, just like a writing habit, just like a prayer life, there's going to be inspiration. There are going to be times when you're really excited about what you're reading. There are going to be times when you're really excited and, and motivated to do a particular intellectual project. And then there are going to be times when it feels like work and when it's drudgery. And guess what? Both of those times, both of those kinds of times, it's still going to be worth your while. And so what you have to do is get in a rhythm, a habit, a routine that will stay you on the course through the good 
and the bad times, through the encouraging and the discouraging times. And I would propose, suggest to you that you start with a small manageable routine. You're going to want at the outset of any project, you're going to be super motivated. You're going to want to do everything. You're going to want to have four hours of reading in the morning and five hours of Greek practice in the afternoon and blah, blah, blah. You're going to burn out that way. Instead, what you should do is pick something that seems too small. I always recommend half an hour of reading in the morning. Just reading. No phones, nothing. Just a book. And physical book if you can. And nothing gets in the way of that. You, the trade-off for it being a small amount of time is that it's an absolute certainty amount of time. Inviolate. If you don't have an extra half hour to spare in your current routine, wake up half an hour earlier. You can always wake up half an hour earlier. Do that every day for at least six months. Similar again to an exercise routine, there are lots of different versions of this that will work. You can spend a half an hour reading, you can spend 20 minutes, I would not necessarily suggest listening to podcasts, but you could spend 20 minutes listening to my podcast. You could spend time with flashcards if you're trying to learn a Greek language and gradually work your way up to reading things in Greek. You can do any number of those projects, take on any number of those goals, but you can't just take on all of them or switch between them, which you're going to be tempted to do. You're going to want to do all these things, this big buffet laid out before you. You're going to want to get everything on your plate. Instead, Pick one that really excites you. Maybe you're going to read the Iliad, let's say, if you probably did in, in your education, but that would be one thing if you haven't already. Maybe instead you're going to read Thomas Aquinas. You're going to get, a, I think, probably a bridged version, I would suggest, of Thomas Aquinas and read through one book of it or something like that. And you're going to do that every morning for 30 minutes for at least six months every day. And at six months, you can reassess and you can see whether you want to move on to a different project or change. But I suspect that what is actually going to happen is that in the course of doing that routine and that what will sometimes feel like drudgery, then the spirit will start to move you into more and more things. And you can let yourself organically grow your routine out. So maybe you start by reading Aquinas and then you think, I really would like to read this in Latin. So you add at the end of the day or onto your phone, you add a flashcards app where you practice the Latin or something like that. And slowly, like a mustard seed, this will grow out into the rest of your life. But start in that small, disciplined, rigid way. It's very easy to fall into kind of a loosey-goosey thing because it feels like it's the arts, do what you want. But again, with the advantage of your education, you know that actually the arts do require rigorous discipline, just like any other work of, say, science or mathematics or uh, engineering or anything. The arts require discipline. Pick a small discipline, just like a workout routine, and do it for six months without fail, and then see what happens. The other part of that is to read things that you like. Don't just pick things that sound fancy or elevated. Sometimes you will have a real hunger for a big canonical work. And sometimes you'll just be like, maybe I'll read a novel. You know, maybe I'll start with a novel and or a small book or something or a book of poems or something like that. And one thing you will start to get attuned to as you grow in the life of the mind is that you have literary appetites just like you have physical appetites. And you will start to be able to feel and notice them as you go. And that's just a sensitivity that you will develop to the sensations of your desires. And you'll start to notice, gosh, I'm like really not making progress in this particular book. And it's just not speaking to me. And maybe you will, you know, through your dedication, you will work your way through it. But then when you get to the end of that, Find something that does speak to you. Think about, like, what am I in the mood for? Am I in the mood for, like, a light novel? Maybe I want to read some P.G. Woodhouse. There's great literature in every genre. And so there's just no end of what you can do because there's no end to this now in your life. It's the life of the mind for a reason. Cultivate that habit. Cultivate awareness of your appetite and let it grow from there. Take two and call me in the morning. I would love to hear after six months or if you report back at some point how this is all going for you. And other listeners, this is not advice that's just limited to somebody that did have a kind of classical education. This is my advice also for anybody that is getting into the life of the mind, even if you are eight or 80. If you feel like you've missed every opportunity, you haven't, you can start again. It's easier than ever in the world it has ever been in history to get books. So you can totally do this. 30 minutes a day is manageable basically for anybody. But don't forget this part. You're going to have to trade something. Sometimes you're going to scroll less on social media. Maybe you're going to be on TV. Maybe you're going to watch TV less. Maybe you are actually going to 
trade something that you like and is fine to enjoy, that isn't empty calories, but this is something that is important to you. And I think it should be. I think it's a dimension of your life, just like your exercise routine and just like your prayer life. Body, mind, and spirit all need cultivation. And if you took those three things and you developed a 30-minute daily routine that you stuck to in all those three areas, imagine how your life would transform after uh, six months, a year, 10 years, like what kind of galaxy brain possibilities are there just from what it would be a total of an hour and a half every day, 30 minutes on the mind, 30 minutes on the spirit, 30 minutes on the body. What if you did that? Just imagine. Uh, the guy to check out here, by the way, if you're interested in another podcast, is at Books of Titans. I had this fella, Eric, on the show, and he's been a friend and a collaborator on a number of things, but he is somebody that has really taken this to heart. His routine is way, way beyond what I'm advising here in a good way. He is reading through, in many cases, for the first time, some of the great works of literature. He's a busy, busy dad who's got lots of other stuff that he's doing, but he's also got lots of stuff that he's not doing. Like, he's not watching any TV or movies, and that has made this room in his life for an enormous and rich journey through the classics. So, one more time, that podcast is called Books of Titans, and I really think he would be an excellent role model for you if you were trying to get on that path. There are others. There's there's the Classical Books podcast. There's a bunch of different podcasts that you can check out as part of this, but I really commend Eric to you as a model for this kind of training. All right. Love that question. As always, if you want to write in with me and give other questions, it's rejoiceevermore.substack.com. And you can DM me or email me or anything like that. Um, if you like this show, I would love for you to share and review, uh, give it five stars, or at least keep your bad opinions to yourself. Uh, but a five-star review really helps to move the show up the algorithm and to demonstrate to people that people are listening. And we love new listeners as well as old listeners. Make new friends, but keep the old. Thanks again. I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.